and welcome back to AR Tales, aka the ARC Podcast. I am AR Mirabal, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Larissa Brandt, author and artist. Her book, Birthright of Scars, is coming out soon, November 22nd, 2022. She is right now at the proof reading and cover design stage of the book, which as anyone going through the stages is not easy. Every stage feels like it's harder than the next, even harder than the writing, harder than the coming up with idea, the manuscripts, making yourself write 100, 150,000 words. All those compare to the different stages that you go up on. So I can't wait to dive into that. And if I'm not mistaken, this is your first time going through the, that process, right? This is your debut book? This is my first time as a, uh, under my married name. When I was 19, I did self-publish, but I didn't know what, I designed the cover myself and it was, it was trash. So <laughs> I consider this my debut Oh, okay. because I, I don't really have the other ones anymore. Well, I'm glad that we can be a part of the debut. So without any further ado, brrr, Larissa, how are you doing today? I'm doing really great. So excited to be here. And thank you very much for having me. Now, one thing that I want to dive into is um, a question that I always start the podcast off of is how did you get your start in your creative forte, if you want to put it that way? How did you get into writing? I've always loved to write pretty much. I was an early reader and in elementary school, I was trying to write my own books. So even in the summer, I'd be with the college world notebook on the road trip writing down ideas, writing down stories. And I've always been at it. Man, I love that. And it it speaks volumes to everything because I feel like a good 70, 80% of authors that I get on this have the same type of idea. So it's a beautiful that we all have the same kind of origin story where it, it just kind of happened. It was like an obsession of ours when we were children and just developed into maturity. And now we're developing these books that hopefully resonate with uh, with others the same way they resonated with us when we were first reading them. So yes. how the love do, of reading. Yes, the exactly. love of reading brings the love of writing. Yes, yeah, so on that note, what was it that really opened up your eyes to reading? What was the first book that you picked up and it was like, okay, wait a minute, game changer. I've always loved words, so I can't remember that. Um, I just remember my mom teaching me right before I went into kindergarten. And so I was a few like reader phonics books ahead of a lot of my class. And I had a book called The Magic School Bus. Actually, that might not be quite correct. I have it on my author bio on my website, but The Magic School Bus, I had it memorized at the age of three, I'm told. Not from reading it, but just from memorizing it from other people reading it to me. So from there, I, I mean, I just always loved reading books. My God. And what was it about that that called to you? That called to your spirit? Well, it rhymed and there was a fun yellow bus on it that could fly. Oh, it's the flying school bus. That's what it was called, the flying school bus. And from then on, I mean, I just, uh, I guess because when you read, it's like a movie in your head. And I just love that fantasy and that escape. So on that note of fantasy and escape, is that what you would say is the genre that you most relate to the, the genre that you want to keep on developing in or is it something that that opened up your mind to what reading could be but then you kind of drifted elsewhere yeah I'm I'm kind of all over the place with my art so even if I'm painting or something I'll do different moods different genres I don't really stick to one genre I hate the idea of being pinned down to one genre so even when it comes to reading I'm very diverse in my tastes and um, in, in school, I guess, well, I take that back. In school, I was very um, stuck on one thing. I liked reading about horses because that was what I wanted in life was to have horse. And I remember my teachers and my parents having to try to introduce new books to me to get me to read wider and read different kinds of material. So there was that challenge around the fourth grade. And how did that develop in any way did you bring in horses in like any of your later books is there a section in which you kind of like go in a little deeper than most would because of your love of horses no not necessarily I broke away from that I I guess um my reason and my passion is just to explore the things that I'm feeling or dealing with at a certain time 
and writing helps me mm. process that. So if I can't find that in reading, I will write it to to bring it to myself. Wow. Now it makes me think of that of what you're talking about is like writing as an escape as something to kind of get an emotion out. It makes me think of the title of your book immediately, The Birthright of Scars. Scars meaning something that happens to you emotionally or physically that kind of has a, a lasting effect on you. Would you say that the book is within that realm of ideas of dealing with a character going through something in the similar sense? Yes, the book was originally called The Tourmaline Renegade. That was the first title I chose for it. And it just wasn't sticking with people. They couldn't remember the tourmaline part because it's kind of a foreign word to a lot of people. So to better market the book, I started seeking out a new title. And after a while, I landed on Birthright of Scars. And the reason I chose it is because a big part of the main character's culture, his traditional culture that the other society is trying to eradicate is their birthright. It's very important to them. Mm. And when he was taken as a child to receive that birthright, the state left him with scars instead of that special thing. And it, it's got double meaning uh, throughout the series as well. There's a lot of aspects in which it fits. Now, this is a duology. It's a two book series. That is so correct. How do you, how did you plan that out? Would you say you're a pantser or a plotter? <laughs> I believe that I'm a pantser, but if I think back hard enough, um, I did plot this book out. I just don't have the plot anymore because I wrote down like 14 chapters and how they should go. And then I erased them as I overwrote them. So it just all blended into the first draft and it's gone now. Wow. But I'm very much a discovery writer in other ways. Um, I might have a basic kind of loose outline and then it changes 200% from what I originally had plotted out. Now, I have to say that I am in the same exact boat as you were. I initially actually named my book Allegory of the End. And it was the same type of thing as that, like, you know, I thought it was like this cool snappy, like, oh, it's like Allegory of the Cave, man. And then, like, people would, like, would, like it, and it was always something else. It was like, oh, yeah, the story about Affinity of the End. Oh, what was the Allegory of Tomorrow? What was it again? It was always with that, like... <laughs> changing something up and I was like all right that's when I knew that I had to go for the re-release and I said you gotta make it you gotta make it work for the readers yeah honestly you know like it, it's one of those things that um you don't want especially now like if you pick up a, a good textbook nowadays don't really surprise you it has like a cool cover it has like a like a you know like a I there is a math book and I know this because it conflicted with my title called into the void a math book Come on, man. Leave some for, leave it for, like, if, if you're doing a math book, call the A, math, math, with like <laughs> big letters and that's it, no cover design. It's math. Why do you need all this crazy stuff? Leave the titles to the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I completely understand with that because um, for as much as we want to say, especially in the industry that we live in now, like the way that everything is being developed, it is very easy for someone to judge your book by its cover by its title by a million things and it's really heartbreaking because you as the author have poured in you know time isn't even we're not even talking about time we're not talking about the year two years that it took for you to write it we're just talking about the mental anguish of a year of going through that <laughs> of, of going through with like writing a book and to have someone turn you away over something so benign over something right. so small it's like yeah give it a chance <laughs> give it a chance <laughs> <laughs> come on um but I guess it's one of those things that you just have to like develop and learn as like an author you know uh mm -hmm. at first I that's something that got me very much in my head you know it was the guy in the background with the leather jacket smoking a cigarette like hey man if they can't if they can't vibe with it then I guess it maybe not it's not for them listen you gotta you know you gotta give help sometimes <laughs> you gotta be like <laughs> all right you know maybe I don't know everything in the universe and kind of like give it up to certain things so I love that progression and just kudos for being able to realize that before the actual release of the book unless there's something like me and very stuff for a year basically and have to like go back and like oh well maybe I made a mistake um but one thing that I really wanted to go on like outside of the whole thing that you're doing with you know changing the book or anything like that do you think there's anything that you change of the plot itself in order to kind of make it more wide to audience, maybe 
there was something that you really felt personally about and you gave it to somebody and maybe they didn't get, respond the same way. So you kind of tweaked anything. Was there anything that outside of the title, were there any larger changes that you made to the book throughout the process of creating it? Uh, it started off as a pretty safe G-rated read and it quickly became an R-rated read. So at times I wish I could nerf it, but I feel like if I did that, it would lose its ability. I mean, its power. I, I feel like that's where its power sits in is just how raw and real it gets sometimes or how gritty, it, you know, it is. Now, what do you think sparked that change? At first, was it something that you did it as a, as like an audience tool? Like, all right, this is what I want my audience to be. And then when you started writing, it was more like, all right, I have to be true to myself and how I want to be creating things. Or was it more vice versa that you realized that not, the, aud the adult audience would have been a better marketing strategy? Not necessarily because I wrote it for myself. I wrote the kind of book that I wanted to read. Mm. So I think what happened is the more I would go through a scene, the more I would see and, and receive those images again and hear the characters speaking, the more I would fully realize the weight of the situation or just how dark the situation was. And I would continually kind of bring that out and bring that out, just like molding clay, just kind of rubbing in the details until they were just the way that I wanted them. Wow. So taking that idea, because I love the, the clay analogy, were there any points where you just had to scrap the entire thing and pick up a new ball, basically? Were there any times? No. Wow. No. Okay. Surprisingly not, because I have started books over from scratch, hmm. but this one did, that did not happen. So without any further ado, and without getting into spoilers, because again, mark your calendars, November 22nd, 2022. That's 11 2 2, two, two. Pretty sure that might have done been done intentionally right there. I love the numerology aspects of it. The, the mirror. That, that was that was intentional, but I've had to push it back. So we're looking at January right now. And you know what? That that isn't even a heartbreaking thing, folks. This happens all the time, honestly. So, it's only because of the cover. Well, it's that's, because of the cover. that's how you know it's going to, like, you're taking your time to really, like, produce a product that people will love and will stay in the test of time. So January, mark your calendars, birthright of scars. So without any further ado, can you give a little background, a little synopsis of what the book is about without revealing too much about it? So it's a dual point of view. It follows two main characters. And Disrael is the primary, the male protagonist. He is from the Pyran culture, which is being oppressed by this um, empire that's full of cobalt culture. And they're in the process of rounding up his people to put them in their own sector. The, the empire is made up of sectors, which is like a nation states. And they're trying to get all of these people out of these sectors into their own sector under the guise of them having their own sector and being free there. But Disrael sees that it, it's going to lead to extermination. And so he is trying to resist this and he gets, um, he assumes an identity. He doesn't realize the weight of the identity. He just assumes a, a token of his people on his, his outfit. And it accidentally resurrects a dead legend that most people have forgotten. But the state, he's, he quickly becomes the state's number one enemy, and they they uh, put a bounty hunter on him, who is a renowned renegade catcher. And she's the other point of view, Ambrosia. And uh, fate kind of pushes them together, and a slow burn romance blossoms out of that. Wow. So they are enemies, enemies to lovers, not in a misunderstanding sort of way, but they are literally on opposite sides of a genocidal conflict and have to come to, to terms with how a friendship and, and romance. So it is an adult and gritty version of Romeo and Juliet in a sense. In a way, yes. And I have to say, um, as you were talking about the, the aspects of it, I had to question it. I was like, wait, is she talking about my book? Did we like start something off together? My book's exactly like that. Duology, the things are broken up into sectors, but it's sci-fi. It's a completely different genre. So it just... I love how all those come together. So if you, any person listening, if you read any of my book and liked it, make sure to pick up this book and keep an eye out for it. Keep an eye out for Larissa in general. I just love the way your brain works. Love the way that you're developing these plots and these storylines. 
And on that note, it makes me wonder how you go about developing your characters. How did you develop this idea of an assassin? How do you develop the idea of a slow burn romance? Was it something that, because again, you did say that you're, you were creating the book that you wanted to read. So mm-hmm. what, what was that general idea? Like, all right, you know what? What if we made a this, but this happens? What was that inception? So the, the inception moment happened after watching Tron uh, Uprising. I had seen Tron Legacy in 2020. And then I loved the movie so much. I wanted more of the characters and more of the world. And so I was just like on the web searching and I came across Tron Uprising on YouTube and binge watched the whole first season. But there's only one season because they quit making the show. Disney ran it in 2011 and they stopped after season one, which is a total tragedy. But it left me with a hangover because I fell in love with these programs named Beck and Page and they had they were in love and the season ends and there's just no closure. And I'm like, I need closure. I need closure so bad. (laughs) So I'm thinking about this. And that's when my what if questions came. I was like, what if Beck were actually an ISO during the ISO purge? And what if Page was a um, she was part of a special elite special forces, all female assassin group and, and everything. And that's where the what ifs came. And then um, as I was pondering that, the muses stepped forward. That's when I heard my character, Dizrell, first speak to me. I was at a bonfire with friends on a Sunday afternoon. And he stepped out of the blue. He's like, this is my name. This is who I am. This is the world. And I just had like this download of information about the technology and the world and everything. And I was just scrambling to write it all down. And then within three days, I sat down at the computer and just hammered out within the course of three weeks, a 70,000 word manuscript from his point of view only. Wow. And that was the first draft. And then from that point, did your other character speak to you? And did that become the other half of the story? Yes. Yes. Then the story doubled in size and got that other point of view. And it opened up all kinds of new things because we got to see the conflict from her side and her culture. And then his like bilingualness came out and all the cultural aspects. And it just, it developed from there once that second point of view got put in. Now, this may be a more of a personal question, but as an author like that is just fascinated with duologies myself, like dual per, uh, you know, two point of views kind of conflicting for that exact principle. I love the idea that one person can view one thing. And as a reader, you believe the narrator. That's the whole idea. So whatever they say is golden law. And then you get this mm-hmm. other perspective and you're like, all right, which one is what's actually happening like happening here? And I love the idea that when it's split like that, because it doesn't answer any questions, it just gives you information and you derive the answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that because it's, it leaves the work for us. It makes the book into a canvas instead of something, instead of a textbook that you just mm-hmm. learn information from. So from that point of view, how, uh, how did you separate that? Did you make it half and half or did you make it the chapters interconnecting? At first I was doing his chapter, her chapter, his chapter, her chapter. But then by like the third, fourth or fifth draft, I forget where it was, uh, fourth or fifth, then sometimes there'd be two of his chapters and one of hers or two of hers and one of his. So a couple extra scenes, chapters got put in and it wasn't even, Mm. but it's still predominantly his than hers. And so you get to see the conflict from within behind the renegade's mask, and then you get to see it from the outside, and then you get to see them interacting where she doesn't know he's the renegade, and then seeing like after they've had a date where it's him and her and then she faces him as the renegade and doesn't know it's the guy she's just sitting with on the park bench so it's like there's all this complexity to the identities of these two characters and how they interact with the world yeah I mean uh like you said that like when you're developing these books it feels like it's a a movie in your mind there's no better scene in a movie than like you know when the the bad guy that comes in the last five minutes of the of the movie that to you just appeared was actually in the very first scene and just like brushed the shoulder of the main character and you're like oh man and it's it just op- it blows your mind open that's the type of stories that I get immediately hooked onto and another Same. thing and another thing that blo- that really just opens me up is even the the mere mention of technology. So when you said that this character appeared to you and, and describe the world describe the technology what was that world building that he was referring to again without spoiling anything because that is part of the hey, you know the allure but is there yeah. anything that you can kind of give away without giving too much oh uh, it's it's fine um it's in a 
the setting changes a lot, but predominantly we're in an urban setting that is, it's a, a, the city sector is probably the size of Shanghai as far as population. And it's just got massive skyscrapers. And the people there only drive motorcycles, but they're not fuel powered. They run on a, um, like a magnetic levitation energy, something called core stones. And the core stone emits such a strong UV light that you can't look at, it'll blind you if you look at it without eyewear protection. So they keep these core stones covered inside the bikes and they run pretty much silently. And um, they also have maglev trains. But the most fascinating thing he brought to my attention, oh, like lights, they use a lot of stones. So uh, piezoelectric technology with quartz crystals and things. So a lamp, you, you twist a dial on a lamp and the rock lights up, like these yeah. special rocks. And so they're not using light bulbs, they're using rocks to light the place. And uh, but the most fascinating technology is their clothing because they weave stone into their clothing and and also like graphene circuitry. So with the insertion of like a flash drive, you can change the pattern on your suit. And the color and also like stones that when the wearer breathes, they kind of like radiate light. Whoa. So instead of your like typical sci-fi space suit that's just like skin tight, like Catwoman suit or something, these, they, they're called skins because they fit like a, a skin. Like the idea of a skin came from a game. When you play a game, you adopt your character and you choose a character yeah. skin, like Minecraft, a character skin. And so they call these skins and they can change the appearance of the skin on the higher tech ones with the, the insertion of the chip. And so that's how the character changes his mask. He's got his motorcycle helmet and his skin. And when he doesn't have the chip in, he looks like an ordinary citizen, puts on his helmet, puts the chip in, and it changes to the renegade and everything blacks out. So it's an instant change. My God, like, I know that this is, I, I hate bringing in like my ideas with this, but I'm just vibing so hard with what you're saying. because It's one of those things, it's like, um, it's like Newton talking to the other guy that was working on calculus. It's like, wait, you were doing that too? Across the world, you were just working on that? Because I have a technology called, uh, I think they're called hyper closets, where they, they wear like an omni linen, which is basically kind of just like a, a, a programmable uh, textile. Then they go mm -hmm. in there and you kind of like an app on your phone or like on the screen of the closet, you can just change your outwear and it goes exactly as, as you described. Not exactly like that, because I'm assuming that yours also adds like mass. So like it, it would add like armor or like shoulder plates if needed be, right? No, not, it wouldn't be that high tech. Well, that's that's crazy. That, that's gonna that's gonna be. I love the similarities. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, it's one of those things that this is why I generally just love sci-fi so much because it's not even about the concept. How many stories have there been about clones, about alien invasions, about X, Y, and Z? And it doesn't matter how many times it's redone because the next person to do it is always gonna do it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I love hearing what you've done with it, with the ideas. It immediately makes me wonder that now that you're done with all the, the creative process, you're moving onto the stage while well, you're on the current stage of proofreading and book cover designs, I have to ask a question for the people out there that are also authors that are, are potentially listening to this and thinking like, oh, maybe, can I, can't I? And by the way, the answer is you can, believe me, you can. Um, so just go for it, honestly. There's no, no reason to ever get caution to the wind, just go. How are you treating this? What are you seeing? How are you approaching the whole thing of proofreading? Have you paid for a service? Are you reaching out to friends in the community? The cover design, how are you attacking that? I feel like that in itself is always an interesting question because there's a couple different routes you can go when going with a book cover design. You can either go like, all right, well, this is my genre. Let me look at the highest selling genre, like genres out there of that list and basically, you know, do some type of mirroring of like what they're doing, or I'm going to pick what I want to do. I'm going to, I always like these type of covers when I was a child or when I was in high school. And this is the type of stuff that I'm going to make because this is for me at the end of the day. This is my dream. I was very open to the cover. I like, I had ideas and concepts that I liked, but at the same time, I needed somebody that could say, this is going to sell. This is what you need for your book. And I wanted a cover designer that would instill that in me. Um, the cover designer and I have a concept for both books that I like, and we're almost done with the first one. We're just nitpicking over a few things right now. So uh, hopefully in the next two or three weeks, we should have that full render finished. And um, it's, it's, 
I didn't want it to look spacey and sci-fi because this is not a sci-fi space fantasy. This is just a a modern world in a fantasy setting. So instead of a fantasy where you've got castles and dragons, this is a fantasy where the world is kind of modern like ours in some ways, but also set back in others. Damn, so it's off. just not connected to our world. It could be on another planet. It could be on this planet at another time. It's just disassociated with our history and our and our world. God, hats off to you. I mean, honestly, you've you've really created so like I, I'm I'm floored. Honestly, I I'm very much invested in this book. I myself, I'm definitely adding it to my TBR. This is, this has a stamp. This has a stamp. Honestly, if you listen to this podcast even to any level of degree, make sure to put this book on your TBR as well. My God, honestly, birthright of scars. So. It is a, a two book series that you're going with. So do you have any ideas for the next book? Do you have a title going? How are you dividing it up? Is it Birthright of Scars, part one, part two, rising, raising? I don't know. How are you doing the, the titling? The, the, the second book is finished because this started as one book. I divided it up into two right before attempting to publish. It was a 245,000 word manuscript. Um, and no matter how much I tried to pare it down, my beta readers were saying, no, you need to keep this scene, elaborate on this. There was only like probably 3,000 words that I could have removed that others thought would be safe to remove. And so I was like, you know what? I need to find out if I can chop this thing in two. And I found, I, I was seeing it as, as one story. I was like, there's absolutely no way. And I couldn't even fathom it as two books for a while. But now I can't really see it as one book anymore because once I found the three-act part for the first and the three-act part for the second and found that dividing line, then I began to see it as two books. And, and now it makes sense as two. So it's finished and it's titled and it's ready to go. I'm just postponing the publication of the second book to give the first one time to get a readership. My God. Again, genius. Everyone's path is different and it's not knocking anybody that did the opposite. Cause let me tell you, I did the far opposite, but to me, there is, there is no better route, especially as when you're going out this alone, when there's not a huge publishing house behind you, there is no better route than developing a community, reaching out to, to readers, having a conversation with your readers. And especially if you can have both books ready to go before publishing, I mean, <laughs> sky is the limit. That is the, that is the main fear of, of people. Cause now as you have this, development cycle as you're letting the book breathe you're also working on the third book and you just have the cycle going mm -hmm. i mean genius 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 what i love so much about the way this worked is that it's going to feel cohesive like one book because it was all written out as one book so the foreshadowing and all the things that are glazed in there are glazed evenly between both books it's not like i had to go back to the first book to write i, I wrote it as one book it's like writing a, a seven part series is one book and you're like, oh, this is a seven part series and you chop it up. But it's all it's all like one package. My God, so. I am blown away, folks. If you are not, I don't know what is with you. Maybe your sound is down. Maybe you didn't hear this correctly. Ha only answer I can logically think of because I want core store jewelry. I want core stone clothing. I want to. I want to emit light in the winter. I mean, my God, I had a similar idea and I'm still more blown away about that idea. It's, it's not even fair, folks. <laughs> my God. Uh, again, <laughs> this has been phenomenal. We are approaching the end of the podcast of this episode, which is, oh my God, I don't think I've ever said, unfortunately, with more vigor, because I could keep talking about these type of things back and forth. We could have a whole segment where we just trade technology back and forth and honestly maybe we should i'm not even kidding that's something that we're going to have to talk about in, in our own time maybe have like a real section um on instagram put it on tiktok who knows what because i i just can't believe that we're, we're on such a similar path with technology and everything goes i just love the way you're putting together your world the world building the technology i mean my god you, you need to, folks. And again, you can find all of her stuff on social media. Instagram, she has a website, which is larisabrant.com. Just 
Her name is exactly how it's spelled in the video dot com you can find it in the description on the banner it's going to be all over the place make sure to give it a look give her some love and make sure to follow her on her amazon author page that way you get a notification the moment the book drops you can pre-order it do all the things folks blow it up well worth it i have loved this conversation and i want to turn it over to you now is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to give attention to is there anything you want to give a shout out any person you want to give a shout out to um, well, I, I really have had some help from some wonderful authors that have become close to me recently. And one of them you just had on your podcast, Cassie Sanchez. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like we've been tag teaming, she's been a, a great help to me and encouragement. And, um, I, one thing I love about this book would be a lot of the side characters. Um, I, I have cameo characters that. I don't know how to say this. They're just very vivid. And um, (laughs) it's like they're on center stage. They act like they're on center stage, even if they're there for just a page. And I hope that that people enjoy those characters or find themselves in some of those characters because uh, finding yourself in a book and where, what role you would play in the society and and a conflict like this, I think is important. So I'm just I portray different kinds of people, like um, some of the soldiers that the hero interacts with. Each one has a choice to make, is what I'm trying to say. As a side character, some of them try to do do good, even though they're on the side of the wrong, because they have a good heart. It's like, even in the midst of oppression, you've got people that their heart's in the right place, even if they make mistakes, or there's just so many layers to the side characters and their choices. And I, I like writing side characters in a book like this for that reason. My God, you are singing my song. You are singing my song, honestly. <laughs> this is such a good sales pitch. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if I was a if I was a Netflix executive, I'd be I'd be hitting that button so quick. I think I'd break a wrist. Um, <laughs> just honestly, blown away. Make sure to do all you can to follow and support this author. It's going to be well worth it. And thank you for coming on the podcast. It's been a blast definitely want to get you back on the podcast and i am so serious about that real thing we got to do something with this this is, this is too much common energy between us to not channel it into some method and she also had a video series of her own where she kind of goes upon her reading and her proofreading on instagram go and check that out too i think that's an awesome little thing that you're doing especially with marketing marketing is such a such a beast that I feel every single author, I haven't met one single author that has nailed it or likes it. I know authors that are doing well, but even if you ask those people, it's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm over here just, you know, spinning plates and every so often one, one goes. It, it is such a battle. It's such it a is. battle. You're fighting an algorithm that has no face and does, they don't, you don't even know what it's doing. But here we are and just... That's why I always give it up to people that find new and exciting ways in order to promote themselves and their books. And I think you're one of those people which I am glad I got you on the podcast. So thank you again. Thank it's going to be the end of the episode, end of the podcast, AR Tales, AKA the ART podcast. I've been AR. This has been the magnificent Larissa. I mean, folks, it, I, I almost want to repeat everything I've already said. Just make sure to follow, make sure to support. It's going to be phenomenal that book is definitely going to be on that shelf right there. I promise you, you can't see it, but use your imagination, right? Like I'm right. I'm reading it to you. It's right there. I have Cassie's book right next to me. I have thousands, well, like thousands, thousands of words. I have dozens of authors that I love on here and she is a hundred percent just made herself to the, to this shelf. And I hope you do the same. This is going to be the end. Quick little note. I am having a birthday sale. My birthday was just this Monday, October 24th. When this releases, it'll be, I don't know, a couple of weeks late. But I am holding a sale on my website, neotino.net, for my book. You can pick it up $1 the ebook or 15 bucks for the signed copy paperback release bundle with a whole bunch of different posters and quick little knickknacks in there. So make sure to give that a look. And most importantly, Make sure to follow Larissa on everything possible. We will be back with you next week with another creative 
another kin, another person just going out and doing what they love. And it's going to be a lovely conversation at that. So peace out.